This is Annuity Straight Talk. Since 2008, your host, Brian Anderson, has helped clients nationwide navigate the complex market for annuities. With Brian's assistance, hundreds of clients have achieved a profitable and secure retirement. I would know, because Brian has answered many of my questions concerning annuities and retirement planning. So that you can benefit as well, let's get started. Here's Brian. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Annuity Straight Talk podcast, episode number 44. Uh, Going back to story time today just because uh, I felt it appropriate with summer coming. Uh, Really excited about this one. Uh, episode 44, how mules are like annuities. So people that know me know that I like to ride horses, pack mules, ride mules, pack horses, all those types of things. And I think mules are like annuities because they fit, a, uh, they suit a purpose. Um, they do things that a horse cannot do. They, uh, are highly intelligent, incredible creatures and I absolutely love mules, um, but I also love horses. And there's certain things a horse can do that a mule cannot. And it really, it's an analogy that I think suits retirement planning again. And these are all the things that tie together in my life and one of the reasons why I do what I do. Because when I make a recommendation or uh, I pursued a career path, it has, has to make sense to me. Uh, I'm a bit of a free spirit in the sense that I, you know, I like personal freedom, uh, very libertarian. You leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. Uh, you need my help, I'm happy to give it if you ask nicely, all those things. Um, and, you know, feel like, you know, when you give something, you do it for the right reasons. Don't expect to get anything back, but if you do it for the right reasons, you will uh, receive that, you know, very, it's like karma. Um I believe if you do good things and good things happen, if you do bad things, bad things happen. Um, So a lot of these things intertwine. And the reason why I bring this up again is it it, it tells a story about, um, about me so people can get to know me. But then also like I try to, you know, you use analogies and stories to help people understand a topic. And this is, I, I don't care what your profession is, whether you were a, a doctor, an engineer or, uh, you know, a computer scientist or whatever it was, whatever you were, um, you often had to explain a complicated matter to a lay person, right? So, and when people think annuities are complicated, I like to draw, uh, tell stories and draw parallels and show similarities to a real world example. And that's kind of, this is one of my attempts to do that is to say, Hey, it's not complicated. You have to think about the base factors and the, the, the real reasons why you want it. And so, and in the last couple of weeks, I've had a few people make appointments with me and they say, Oh, I hate annuities or I never liked annuities or, um, and I, and I like to ask, well, why do you hate them? Because they may have a good reason. And a lot of it comes down to it's either fees or trust, you know, everybody, cause the, the ads about annuity fees, and I've covered that so much and i'm probably gonna have to keep doing it so i apologize to the regular listeners we'll have to talk about fees more and more over time i'll try to space it out with uh with content that's not so redundant but um you know so fees are a concern obviously we can do it without fees and and i've talked about that a billion times so but you know one example of someone who hates annuities because they were they inherited a bunch of money or a bunch of annuities from uh from their dad and they, they called me because they said, well, we're looking at these things and something doesn't sound right. And the, you know, the dad passed away when he was in his mid eighties and they said, well, he's got, he had like nine annuities, but he had owned 40 some annuities over the years. And uh, in looking at it, you know, long story short, this podcast is not about that story, but we looked at it and it turned out that the agent was selling him an annuity and surrendering it to sell him another annuity a couple years later. So he had paid an astronomical, it wasn't a small amount of money. It was, I, I think it was north of 2 million bucks. And 
he had lost money with annuities because he had a scumbag agent. And I literally, I, and I'm not kidding. I punched that guy in the face if I could find him, if I knew who he was. Um, that's not the right way to do business. And it's not, the annuity was not the fault of that person or, or it was not the reason why that guy didn't like him. Um, but it was a, it was a scumbag scam artist that, uh, screwed over his dad. Of course he wouldn't like annuities because the experience was like several hundred thousand dollars in surrender charges went directly into this guy's pocket. He was only thinking about himself anyway. So I understand there's some legitimate reasons to be very skeptical, but the purpose of annuities is to improve your life and to create safety. So again, we're not going to talk about that too much. I'm going to tell you this story. And those who were here, I think I put this out on a newsletter two years ago. And because summer's coming, um, I'm just kind of, my mind's going toward, Hey, find an adventure, go do something fun, spend your weekends doing, uh, something great. You guys know, uh, I've told you before, I got some hunting permits that are once in a lifetime opportunities. I'm really looking forward to enjoying the outdoors this summer, but I still will be around. So I'm not checking out by any means. September is going to be tough. Uh, anybody that needs something in September, we'll talk about it when we get there. Uh, but we've got three solid months before that happens. So I am going to share my screen and we're going to talk about it. And as you can see how meals are like annuities, you can look in the background and that's my other screen and you can see, uh, well, let me, let me just show you right here. Cause it's on my main screen. So that's me and my favorite living creature in the world is my mule jitterbug. She is so sweet and so nice. Um, she's a little bit nervous and skeptical, but she's not mean at all. She just will not trust right away. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, cause I didn't have her since she was a baby. Um, but I wrote this newsletter two years ago after this was during the COVID lockdowns. I scored a backcountry permit for Yellowstone national park, which was awesome. It's something I've wanted to do for a long time. And it was, you know, just one of those things where I got to take the trip, uh, when the world was going to hell in a handbasket, everybody stuck people in New York city were stuck in apartments for six months. Oh, holy cow. Like I'm a blessed individual. I was grateful, grateful to do it. And I remember when uh, the lockdown started in March, we didn't know if the, uh, if Yellowstone, if the park was going to be open. Now, a lot of you have been to Yellowstone. Many others want to go and you realize that uh, anybody who's been there realizes how many people are there, but we did this trip where, you know, we had to drive through the park. And of course we saw a lot of people. And then we spent five days in the back country and we saw four people. So how often do you get to spend five days in Yellowstone and only see four people? It was incredible. Um, and I came home and I just, I really wanted to tell the story. Um, cause I just thought it was really interesting and say, Hey, you know, I took a break. You should take a break. And again, get treat people to dream and imagine what you can do in retirement and enjoy yourself. I did leisure and retirement, talked about a fishing trip a while ago. And, you know, it was hard to find heavy topics because there's a lot of stuff going on right now. And I thought, you know what? Summertime's coming. I'm thinking about this. I'm just going to put this into a podcast. And it's an introduction for anybody who was not around two years ago when this came out as the newsletter. So um, you can see it here. Uh, you can just search, go to the newsletter type in mule in the search bar. You'll find this article. It's simple and easy. And I start it steady, reliable, strong, intelligent, tough is a good start. Anyone who uses the first word stubborn to describe a mule needs to look in the mirror between mules and annuities. The only people that don't like them are the ones who don't understand them. So in that, and I, I have this uh, like idea and a lot of people, like, if you're not from the West, or, the, you know, if you're not from the West, you understand you kind of have these images in your mind of like breaking a horse, like what the cowboys used to do and all that stuff. Right. And so I pull up these photos. I looked at this real quick and I said, you know, in breaking a horse, you have guys like you got a rope on the front, a rope on the back. You got a whip going. The horse is bucking, freaking out, going crazy. And at some point that horse is going to give up. And that's what breaking a horse is. Now, uh, 
the more intelligent trainers will cons- will say starting a horse, they think breaking has a bad connotation to it. And I totally agree. If you look over on the sidebar, it's like getting these horses to buck and you basically work the buck out of them, right? And they scare the crap out of them to a point where the horse gets so scared, they know nothing else but to, you know, sit in one spot and just do whatever they're told because they're afraid that the whip's going to come out or they're going to get smacked, whatever is going to happen, right? You can do that with a horse. But if you do that to a mule, you might get it to be calm, but that will be a dangerous mule. That ho- that mule might do what you want it to do, but it might strike at something that it's not sure of. It's going to be scared. It's going to be on edge. A mule is far more intelligent. So a horse will forget. A mule will not. Now, for anybody who doesn't know, a mule's mom is a horse. So it's a male donkey and a female horse. And so they get the intelligence of the donkey. And again, donkeys being, oh, they're stubborn. Well, no, you just don't know how to deal with them. So when you when you train a mule, you have to be more methodical. You have to be nicer because they will never, ever forget. Now, if you walk up to a mule and you see that mule and all of a sudden, uh, and that mule like either bites at you, strikes at you, or just takes off, whatever. Now, there's two possibilities. Either that mule was a, ab- uh, well, both of them including uh, include abuse. It was either just abused and beaten into submission and it doesn't trust anyone, or you look like someone that, you look like the person who actually did it to that mule and they think. So I have a jitterbug as sweet and nice as she is. When the farrier comes to trim her feet, he has to take his shaps off. If he walks up to her with shaps on, she freaks out. Now she doesn't strike because she's not mean, but the shaps that, you know, the leather shaps that he has are, um, remind her of something. Now I got her when she was five years old and she was very, very skittish. And so they remind, they remind her of something that was a, you know, a bad thing that happened to her when she was a baby and nobody can go up to her. So I can't ri- I can't wear shaps if I ride her and I love to ride her. She's a favorite, my favorite one. Okay. Um, but that's just an indication of what happens. Now, a horse, kind of forget about it. I, I always say, like, horses are kind of dumb, and mules are really smart, and they will not forget. And so, but if you get a nice, kind mule, which we have, I've got all of them nice and kind, they'll all come right up to you, and you can say, okay, well, that mule was treated well and done. So you got to be, when you train him, you got to be more methodical, you got to be assertive, but kind, and that will, you know, lead to great things, but it's not the same as breaking a horse. You can, if you go on a dude ride, uh, out in the, out in the West, you know, Wyoming, Montana, wherever, and you get one of those dude horses that just puts its head down, you know, right in the back end of the horse in front of it and just walks along two things. That horse is either really old and tired, or it was beaten down to a point where it has no personality anymore. Uh, and sadly that is the case. Uh, in a lot of, a lot of situations. So how mules are like annuities. Um, and that's, I, I don't know, I guess I don't have to say it every time, but this whole thing, uh, intertwines in it. So, um, I've got like a lot of people know, I've got a friend of mine who writes, uh, he's a journalist. He writes the American, uh, or writes the retirement income journal. And I've known him for probably 12 years, maybe. And I guess it was uh, 2017. We'd talked about, Hey, come to Montana. And he finally said it was February's book and a ticket and he was coming out. And so I thought, Hey, I'm going to take him onto the pack trip. So I took him into the Bob Marshall wilderness. Um, but he had never been on a horse or anything. Okay. He didn't have any experience whatsoever. So I put him on a mule and then he just sat there and the mule plodded along. Now what, what's really cool about mules and in rough country on the trail now, I learned this from an old man who ran a trail riding business outside of Glacier Park. And he said when he gets somebody really nervous about the trail ride, he gets one of his good old solid mules and puts that person on the mule. And that person will never ride anything else for the rest of their life. And I know several guys who only ride mules because of that. But I did that for my wife on her first trip. I said, she didn't know what she was doing. I'm going to put her on a mule. Uh, years later, I bought her a horse and she loves that horse. And, uh, she did really well with the horse as well trained. It's a great horse. 
Uh, and she said, you know, I, I love this horse and this is more fun, but I felt a whole lot safer when I was on a mule. So um, horses are, are incredible, uh, but they are kind of unpredictable. My horse is a good, solid, steady mountain horse. He's, you know, dog gentle. He's a wonderful animal, but a butterfly comes across a trail and he'll freak out, right? Um, a stick is laying in the middle of the trail. He stops and huffs and can't figure out what's going to go on. Like the stick's going to attack him or the butterfly's going to get him. Who the heck knows why? Um, but when he does that stuff, the mules are coming behind us and they just kind of sit there and they wait. And as soon as he realizes he can take a step forward, they're sitting there waiting and they might eat a little grass. And he decides he can walk and he always takes it like of the stick that he's scared of or the butterfly when he's passing it. He'll always kind of jump when we get past it. And so you got to be kind of ready when you're riding him. And, he, you know, he's a little nervous. But the mules are just kind of like, hey, whatever. Um, they will identify a threat. So um, it's, uh, it, it's just interesting how patient and intelligent they are in situations like that. They'll know what a real threat is. So uh, we went to Yellowstone and this is like one of my favorite uh, and you see this and I think it's interesting in the movies cowboys ride horses and mules pull the wagon while cowboys are out roping and shooting doing all the cool stuff right mules are just bringing along dinner and the camp and everything and I it's in, like everybody like the the tv show Yellowstone a lot of people call and say oh I love that show Yellowstone and it was, you know, it was, most of it was filmed about, you know, 20 miles south of my dad's place down in the Bitterroot Valley. It's not even filmed in Yellowstone, but it, it looks a lot like it. Montana's beautiful wherever you go. Um, but it, it's funny. They went to, I think in the season two, they went to summer camp where old John Dutton, uh, Kevin Costner took his grandson out and they went in wall tents and they, on the ranch next to the river and they went fishing and hanging out for a couple of weeks. Uh, but I, that was the first time where you know you saw it was i think it was lloyd like the old cowboy uh he was taking the wagon and they had sure enough had two mules pulling the wagon right because that's what they need to survive out there and the mules bring it along so um anyhow so i tell I tell the story a little bit about you know that trip as well and i'll kind of I, I guess i'll touch on parts of it but um when i went on that trip the biggest thing was that my wife was really nervous about her kids. So they're my stepdaughters and they had ridden the mules before, but then going on an extended trip and covering a lot of territory, she was really nervous. And I knew, I knew my mules were in a good spot. I said, listen, they're going to sit on the back of mules. Um, and I told them, I said, you guys take the pictures and they were happy. Their phones didn't work, but I was like, you can keep your phones, but you have to take all the pictures. So what I, what I got from it was I got 90% selfies. I was like, no, you're supposed to take pictures of like me and your mom and and the lake and the, and the streams we cross and those things. And they, no, there was, it's all kind of, ah. um, it was kind of funny, but like, I knew that it would be okay. Um, and I knew the kids would be safe. So, uh, what's interesting, uh, like on the, on the trail with the mules, a mule is different. Their eyes are set a little wider on their head than a horse is. So at any given time, they can see all four feet. So they're very sure footed. They know exactly if a mule kicks at you and doesn't hit you, it means it was a warning. If they mean to hit you, they will. They're deadly accurate. Um, and you have to understand that. So if a mule kicks and misses you, um, you know, and my mules do that dinking around, they'll kick at me, but they've never kicked me. They've never hit me. That means they don't, they don't try to hit me. If they try, they're going to succeed. They're deadly accurate with the, but they can see all four feet at any given time. So when you're riding down the trail and I often, so I'm in, in the front on a horse and I got the mules are packed up and I always, I look back to make sure the loads are riding right. And, um, and out of curiosity, I just kind of like watch them hit the trail and they are able to pinpoint a lot of times, like, like a mule's hoof is tougher than a horse's. And so in, in a lot of cases, they don't need to wear shoes, even on really rocky ground, unless you're taking them like hundreds and hundreds of miles, they'll still wear down a little bit, but, um, it's funny. They protect themselves. Right. And the, the saying is like, you can spur a horse off a cliff, but a mule will not hurt itself. And that's why a lot of people think donkeys are the same. They think stubborn and people say stubborn. Well, the mule, you have not done enough to, to assure the mule that it will not get hurt. So, I have times when a mule is going to stop on the trail and stop and will not move. What does that mean? It means there's a danger they sense that, that you got to figure out. And so I'm grateful for that 
because uh, there are a lot of times where it's been a bear or a moose. A moose is worse than a bear, honestly. Um, and there's something I don't see. Their ears are incredible. Their eyes are incredible. And they see it or sense it. And they've just got to stop and figure it out. If they figure it out and start moving, I realize there's nothing there. But um, it's, it's just amazing how, you know, how certain they are and how they provide that steady, safe uh, element to any of those trips. So I'm always like, the mules make me feel more secure because I know they're coming with me no matter what. Now, a mule's mom is a horse again. Like I said, they will follow the horse anywhere. And they will not leave that horse. So, you know, at nighttime, we're in these big giant meadows in Yellowstone, gorgeous stuff. And you just turn the mules loose and the horses would be on a long rope kind of staked out and the horses can move around in a little circle um, and eat grass and all that stuff. But the mules will roam around and they will not leave the horses, uh, which is pretty incredible because then it's, it's a lot less work for us. It's more enjoyable. We could just sit there have a cup of coffee in the morning and watch the animals play out in the, in the pasture. It's, it's awesome. Um, and that also, you know, people get scared. Oh, grizzly. Do, were you worried about grizzlies? No, I'm not because I've seen mules tree a bear. Um, they have, you know, my big, big mule. Uh, we had wolves in camp in, uh, in, uh, the Teton wilderness a few times. And my, uh, my mules went after and ran those wolves off. Uh, they do the same with a bear. I would put a 1500 pound mule up against the 600 pound grizzly any day. I have no concern whatsoever. I sleep like a baby and those mules are out there happy roaming around eating grass, rolling in the rolling in dirt. They love it. So, um, that's one thing. Again, we're talking safety, security, uh, peace of mind, right? You get a, a good mule trained up. There's nothing better if that's the stuff you like to do. So, um, and another, like, like it's, it's just, it was a really cool trip for a lot of reasons. And I think back to my first pack trip 20 years ago, uh, I remember the coolest thing. I used to hike a lot when I was a kid, uh, growing up, we'd hike into mountain lakes and go fishing. I did that with my dad and my brothers and, uh, I had a great childhood doing adventurous stuff. But, um, you know, w when I first sat on a mule and rode into the mountains, I was sitting there, I was drinking a cup of coffee uh, <laughs> taking pictures. I'm looking around the whole time. And, and it was different for me cause I'd hiked a bunch, but when you're hiking, if you want to stop and look at something, um, you got to stop walking. You want to take a picture. You got to stop walking. Cause when you're hiking, you got to keep your eyes on where you're putting your feet. And the mules do that for you because they're watching the trail and they're doing, you know, picking their spots and staying steady. Uh, amazing, amazing animals. Um, so, uh, it's, it's, it's incredible. Uh, you just get to you take in so much more of the landscape. So mules are just like annuities because they're steady and reliable when everything else is unpredictable. So you think about wilderness experiences, you got moose, you got in Yellowstone, we had a bunch of bison bulls. We're in a pat, uh, we're in a meadow one time we passed and I was kind of nervous about it, but the mules didn't bat an eye. And I think they've got like, they've got some sort of the animals have some sort of communication with each other. And they both said, hey, we're not going to bug you. You're not going to bug me. We're all good. We move through, right? Um, but you have so many things. I, I remember Carrie Pector on that trip. Uh, we were driving home and we had two trucks. Uh, my business partner at the time had his truck and a trailer. And he was noticed a rattle. He had a, a transmission issue with his truck. And, uh, you know, it was kind of one of those things like, oh, no, we got to deal with this. I mean, the trip went great. And, and Carrie said to me, we were pulling out of this little uh, dive bar on a highway in Montana where we stopped to have burgers on the way home. And, and, uh, and Carrie said, you do a lot of things where, where you do a lot of stuff where things can go really wrong. Like this is dangerous. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> I don't know any other way. Cause that's all I've ever done. Um, and it's not, I like to push things. I like to adventure my career is doing things differently than everybody else has ever done them. That's why, uh, my clients can attest to that. Hey, this is different than anything I've ever seen in my life. Uh, it works out. It's fine. The worst case scenario is just fine. Uh, and I like it, especially this day and age right now, times as they are. Um, it's great to be an annuity guy. We had great products, great rates. Everything's coming back. 
and retirees should be jumping at the chance right now. So um, the last part of this story I'll tell you is like the first time I got mules, I remember I bought, uh, I might get a little choked up about this story. I'll try not to. Um, a friend of mine said, hey, there's a guy in Washington that, that uh, has these five mules. He's had them all their lives and they're great. And they were anywhere from, you know, 12 to 18 years old. And he said, um, it's a made string. Uh, he's selling all of them because he can't, uh, he's got a back problem or something. He can't use them anymore. And he just wants to, he, they're not expensive. And they were, they were a really, really good deal. Anyway, he said, I don't have the money for it, but if you want to go in with me, we'll split it. So yeah, we did. We bought five mules. I was like, hell, I mean, the price is so good. I just cut him a check. And he said, I'm going to go pick them up. So I wrote him a check and he went to pick them up. And then we, we rode those guys. And I thought, man, the, and they were, they were all really, really good. And so my grandpa, who, uh, you know, I could, I guess I could tell stories about that at some point, like really, really uh, pivotal figure in my life, just a, a, a wonderful, you know, modest guy. He was not, he's not wealthy. He wasn't rich. He was just well-liked and he was everybody's favorite person in the family. He's you know, telling those old jokes. <laughs> I should do a podcast just telling my grandpa's jokes, but Anyway, he was at the time he was getting, you know, when I got those meals, he was 83, 84 years old and I used them enough. And I thought, man, these are really good. And he always, and I, I was probably the closest one to him because I spent a lot of time with him being geographically closest to him. And so, and he said, you know, one of the reasons we went, uh, we went, uh, you know, hiking and fishing a lot is because that's how my dad grew up. So my grandpa took my dad fishing and they were really outdoorsy. My grandpa was a big time elk hunter. And that's kind of where I got the, I, I, uh, you know, I got the bug for that, uh, probably from him, but it's in my bloodlines. My great grandfather was a bounty hunter in Northern Utah. Uh, it's a really cool story. A bounty hunter, not chasing people down, but he was one of the guys that was charged with, uh, exterminating grizzlies and wolves back in the early 20th century. The stories my grandpa had about the things he did with my great grandpa are unbelievable. And, um, I know that's exactly where my, uh, adventurous bone came from. Um, but anyway, my grandpa was getting older and he was, you know, I was hunched over and, uh, he was a lot weaker. Now my grandpa was like probably the strongest guy I ever knew. I mean, he just had his forearms and his hands were big cause he'd been working farms and ranches all his life. And my grandpa said, you know, I'd just love to I'd love to go into the mountains one more time, catch a fish and eat my fill of trout that cooked over a campfire. Just one more time. I want to do that. And so I, I, I told, you know, my uncle, my dad, my aunt, and I said, Hey, we got to try. It's like, Hey, I got these meals. We could take them on a camping trip. You can't really do anything. Um, and I, I should have pulled up the picture of that. I forgot. Uh, anyway, um, and I said, the, the plan was to hire a helicopter. Like you guys fly in in a helicopter, I'll pack a camp and we can keep them there for a couple of nights. And they all said, oh, no, no, no. He doesn't need to do that. No, he doesn't need to. And you got a, you got an old guy sitting in a chair. He's feeding cows every day and he has nothing left. He's a think about his life. And he always, um, he was very self-deprecating. And I remember, uh, I always, like I always said, I said, he's already got the whole dog. He just wants some, wants someone to push him in, right? Uh, he sat around talking about dying <laughs> for a while. And I'm like, man, I better get on this because uh, he's got to go do it. So nobody would help me with it. And I thought, all right, the only chance I have is to get this old man on a mule. And so I took him. And I remember w when we bought these mules, they all had a personality, okay? And the guy that we bought them from explained each one of them in detail. Well, this is, you know, this mule, this mule. And so this mule, Sarah, um, absolute nicest animal I've ever met in my life. Uh, she was just amazing. And he said, Hey, the deal with Sarah is she's gentle, gentle as can be. And when we go on a week long pack trip into the mountains, Sarah carries the eggs. <laughs> and so that's how steady she is. If you know, if you try to take eggs into the back country, you often get broke. They bounce around a lot, but you want a really, really steady animal. So I get an idea like, hey, I'm going to take grandpa. I think I could put him on this mule and take him into the woods. And so we did. We did a day trip. And I remember I said, hey, grandpa, we're going to do this. And uh, I told him the story. And I said, hey, grandpa, today you are the eggs. 
And uh, it was uh, it was awesome because he sat on that mule. It was hell to get him up and off that thing. <laughs> Um, just a really funny story, but, uh, it's a different, different story altogether. Um, anyway, but yeah, you're the eggs today, grandpa. Can't, I, I told him it was so hard to get him in and out. It's like, he's cramping up and he's, you know, tight and feeble and all this stuff. And my brother and I got him up there and I said, Hey, I said, grandpa, everybody, and everybody that I talked to thought that you were going to get bucked off <laughs> of the mule today. And they were worried about you because you're 85 years old and, and, <laughs> And I said, after seeing how hard it was to get you up and down, you know, on and off that mule, uh, there ain't a rank horse or mule in the world that could get rid of you. He should have gone into bronc riding and rodeoed and made his fortune at 85 years old. He was so, there's no way he's coming out of that saddle. Um, anyway, it's funny, but that, you know, back to the trip in Yellowstone, it was no different with the kids. Uh, put them on a mule. Don't worry about bears. Don't worry about anything. Let them have fun. Let them not worry about it. And, uh, it was, you know, and you think about the time we are in the world, we were then we are now where there's so much uncertainty right now. We got, we got a war in Ukraine. We got, uh, they're talking about food shortages, all this stuff, like the supply chain screwed up. There's so many risk factors out there. Um, and to go back and to enjoy, get back into a peaceful place and be away from people and see a beautiful part of this country. Um, it's amazing at a time like this. So if that doesn't share similarities with a desirable, desirable retirement, I'm not sure what else I can tell you. So, uh, mules are just like annuities, safety, security, when everything else is unpredictable, that's what you want in retirement. It deserves a fair shot. I know some people that have one. I know some people that have a dozen. Uh, it's not anything crazy. If you hate them, tell me why you may be right. Um, but you may just not know all there is to know, and that's fine. Um, give them a shot. It's, it's worthwhile. I'm not recommending everybody goes out and buy a mule, uh, because that's a different, uh, responsibility altogether. So anyway, these are kind of small. I couldn't figure out how to blow them up, but some of the meadows we were looking at wife and the girls happy. We got to camp and they were having a good time. We fished on the, uh, um, on Yellowstone Lake there, which was amazing. Caught some really nice uh, Yellowstone cutthroat trout. That was kind of another uh, indicator of where I was fishing maybe uh, a few weeks ago when I wrote that uh, wrote that uh, newsletter to the podcast. And then here's just some pictures. Uh, you know, riding along Yellowstone Lake was incredible. It was kind of like, uh, it was like driving Highway 1 in California, like on the coast, because it's big, it's a giant lake. Anyway, um, so, and then, and then on the last part of the trip, you know, Lily, the oldest uh, stepdaughter, she just, she kind of wanted to ride in front. She was on Jitterbug and I know Jitterbug will go. And I said, okay, well now, and Jitterbug knows exactly where we're going. She's like, Hey, we stayed here two nights ago. I know that the truck is only seven miles away. I'm going. And so we put her in front and I let the girls ride in front and Jitterbug took care of her. Uh, didn't worry about it a bit. We crossed creeks. We ran into a bear on the way out. And of course it's Yellowstone. So as we got closer to the trail, all the people, uh, that were driving the roads and stuff were running down the trail, uh, to find the bear and you needed an animal animal that was sure footed out front and nice and easy so that Lily, who's not an experienced rider could enjoy the trip. And she said, wow, that was fun. Cause you get to be out front and you get to see it. It's like being the pilot in a, you know, on a plane, you know, those big jet liners, I assume the pilot has the best view, right? So anyway, um, mules are just like annuities. Uh, there's a reason I have them both. A reason I do what I do, and I wanted to share a little bit of this with you guys, people on the podcast, people that weren't here two years ago that could see it. I certainly appreciate the opportunity. Got some good comments on that, but go ahead and look that story up. It's a real quick read, uh, and it's fun, and I like doing it. So again, I uh, appreciate you guys being here for episode number 44, How Mules Are Like Annuities. You can schedule a call top right corner so you see it right here on the uh on the website, any page, this button right up here on the right, schedule a call. If you want to set a time, the number is 800-438-5121. Uh, my name is Brian Anderson. I certainly appreciate the opportunity. I'll be here next week with episode 45. Not sure the topic, but it'll be something good. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. And have a great day. Okay. Bye. <music>
You have been listening to Annuity Stray Talk. The preceding information is for informational and educational purposes only and does not represent tax, legal, or investment advice. The views expressed by guests on this program are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of Annuity Stray Talk or its partners. No information presented today should be acted upon without meeting with a qualified and licensed professional. It is important that you read all insurance contract disclosures carefully before making a purchase decision. Guarantees are based on the financial strength and claims paying ability of the insurance company.